Welcome back to Foundations of Christian Thought as we begin lecture number three of week four. And I'm certain you'll get tired of hearing me say this, but please keep up with your reading as well as working on the different aspects of your critical assignment, which is writing um, your creed. And uh, if you just keep up with that as we go along, I believe that will serve you well. Let's uh, begin looking now at uh, some views of Christ and uh, some atonement theories uh, that follow along. First of all, uh, when we see or understand that uh, Jesus Christ is incarnate, um, it means that it's two natures in one person. And I know that's difficult uh, to understand and uh, even impossible to fully comprehend. Uh, but I want to make certain that we understand that's, a, that's an aspect of our faith that allows Christ to fully accomplish all that God uh, had planned. And that's why at Christmas time, we use the term Emmanuel, which means God with us. It was God who came to us. So he was fully God who came in uh, human form, but he was also fully human. And that must be um, understood in regards to the atonement and other aspects of what Christ has accomplished for us. And so um, let's look at some of the earliest heresies concerning Christ and um, as difficult as it is with us having 2,000 years of history and study in regards to Christ and certainly not fully wrapping our minds around um, all that he is, uh, we look at some of the earliest believers, and I can only think how much of a challenge it must have been, um, as well as some of the earliest ones who, who tried to articulate and tried to um, express Christ in a way that could be understood. And the first one that we want to talk about is adoptionism. Adoptionism is the view of Christ being thoroughly human, but God adopted him and his son at his baptism, or some see it happening at a subsequent time in his uh, period here on earth. And uh, the idea is that uh, he was born fully human, and as Matthew 3 records when he was baptized uh, in the form of a dove, the Holy Spirit descended, um, as John witnessed, and um, that uh, that was the point at which God um, made him or adopted him as his son. And, uh, of course, that doesn't um, fulfill what Orthodox Christianity through time and history has uh, come to be able to conclude about Christ, but uh, that, that's the view of those who are adoptionists. Then there's those who are the subordinationists, and um, this is credited ha as having originated with Origen of Alexander. And um, in subordinationism, both Jesus' essence and economy as the incarnate Lord were less than and not fully God. So he was subordinate in the sense that he was less than. Not to be confused with our English use of the word subordinate, which just means one who would um, submit in regards to maybe position or duty, but that he was subordinate in his, um, in his essence and, uh, and in his being. And so uh, we know that to not be the case from the doctrine of the Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all, in fact, uh, God. So you have adoptionism, subordinationism, um, and this led to uh, a first century group known as the Ebionites. Um, the Ebionites saw Jesus as uh, being the messianic fulfillment of the messianic scripture um, in regards to uh, the Old Testament um, because Jesus kept the Sabbath. Um, he uh, encouraged the keeping of the law. Um, he celebrated the Jewish festivals, um, that, that all that he did uh, brought him in line with the um, Old Testament scriptures being fulfilled. But they did not see him as the Messiah. They saw him as a manifestation of the, the Messiah, um, and the anointed one um, would yet appear at his uh, second coming. And so they saw this fulfillment in Christ, but did not see him as um, 
as being fully uh, the Messiah or the promised one uh, that God had mentioned um, in the Old Testament. Then there's Nestorianism, and um, that was really just a division of the two natures of God. The error here um, is the fact that they saw Jesus Christ as two distinct persons. Um, it's named after uh, Nestorius, um, who was born in Syria and died in the mid-5th century, but he was the primary advocate of this, um, being a monk who was later um, uh, repudiated because uh, he did not accept the, the early title of Mary being known as the mother of God because, uh, uh, because she was the mother of Christ only in respect to his humanity. And so uh, in the Council of Ephesus in 431, uh, that was dealt with, and the fact that Jesus was one person in two distinct and inseparable natures, being both uh, divine and human. Then there's monophysitism, uh, that Christ had one nature that was partly divine and partly human, so they didn't see the two um, being full as human and full as deity. And um, so there was there was just a division, kind of a kind of a partial mixture of the two that made up the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and then docetism, or also probably better known as Gnosticism, was that the sufferings of Christ were apparent; they weren't um, physically uh, real. And um, you know that that after the crucifixion, um, he appeared in a um, in a spiritual body. And so um, they made that distinction, not seeing Christ in a material sense um, or in a physical sense um, in regards to um, who the person of Jesus Christ was when he was here on earth. Um, then there's uh, monothelitism, uh, which that Christ's human will um, had been superseded by his divine will. So again, not seeing the whole of a human being and the whole of God being uh, embodied in Jesus Christ um, and that his uh, human will um, was not fully in um, intact and of course we see that disputed in the book of Hebrews which says he was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin well if he didn't have um, that human will um, then that verse would not be um, clearly articulating the fact that that he understands or he can intercede for us um, as a result of his human will uh, giving way um, to his divine nature. And so it's important that we understand, as John's gospel tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on in John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible's clear about saying, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in Colossians 1, uh, 15, the Bible tells us that he, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, um, the aspect that um, all of the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ in bodily form. So we draw from scripture this understanding that, that Jesus Christ was fully human as well as fully God. Um, so that's the two natures in one person. Um, and uh, his nature or this incarnation, the two natures in one person, is what allows him to fulfill what, uh, let me move myself over here out of the way, uh, what allows him to fulfill what Horton identifies as the threefold office um, of Jesus. And that threefold office in his life, death, and resurrection is known in Christ as prophet, as priest, and as king. As prophet, like the prophets of old, that spoke um, God's word, and they spoke it as directed by God, and their word was validated in the fact that it historically came true. Uh, but he was also priest, 
as the um, as the one who um, approached God on behalf of the people, and of course the Book of Hebrews expounds on that um, to the utmost, and then as King, and that Jesus Christ was born uh, King. Um, it's interesting that uh, Pilate asked Jesus uh, on while he was on trial if he was the King of the Jews, but but he made it clear that his kingdom was not of this realm. And uh, so Jesus Christ was king because he was born king, because he was born the Lord. He was born. And, and we can grasp that to some degree, even in our own human history, that we see monarchies that, um, that produce monarchs as a result of birthright. And so uh, just the fact that Jesus Christ was God who came to us, he was born king. So in that threefold office, as Horton points it out, um, we see the, the fullness of the two natures in one person, as well as Jesus Christ uh, being fully God and fully human in these biblical offices that he fulfilled. Um, now in regards to Christ being prophet, priest, and king, being fully God and fully human, and in regards to Christ um, fulfilling all that God had purposed and planned. Um, that's what we want to use as our basis for understanding uh, some of the different atonement theories. And again, um, these are spelled out quite well in your reading and just want to touch on them to make certain uh, that you have an understanding. And, and as always, don't hesitate to email or contact me. Um, all of my information is listed there on your uh, original syllabus. Um, and um, also feel free to, to, uh, to post questions and uh, we can discuss uh, further. Um, but uh, the first one here listed is substitution. It's the fact that Christ died in our place. Christ died as our substitute. Christ as our substitute bore God's wrath, the wrath that we deserved. He took our place. Um, he was our substitute, and in doing so, because he was uh, the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, because he did live a sinless life, um, he was able to, in that substitutionary death, satisfy the wrath of God, and uh, as a result, reconcile us to the Father. And so uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a summary of the substitution aspect. Um, some of the atonement, other atonement theories, recapitulation, um, Irenaeus and Eastern theology underscore or make the emphasis of Christ's life as well as his death as the undoing of humanity's collective transgression. In other words, that Christ replaced Adam's headship over the human race, Adam being Adam and Eve, um, and, and Christ replaced him. And um, as a result, now is head over all humanity, and it emphasizes then the immortality as a supreme gift of Christ's uh, saving work. And so um, it's the fact that he is seen as the one who took the place of Adam as the federal head um, or the corporate head of humanity. Uh, then there's the ransom theory. Uh, it's also known or called in some circles as the uh, classic theory because of its association with Origen and other Alexandrian uh, theologians. Uh, but this view holds that um, Christ's death was a ransom. Now, that's a scriptural, um, that's a scriptural uh, concept. However, they held that it was a ransom paid to Satan for the ownership of humanity. And the scripture makes it clear that God is God of all, and all that the earth contains belongs to God. Um, so they went awry um, by saying this ransom was paid to Satan when Satan um, does not hold ownership of humanity. And so um, scripture represents Christ's death as a payment of our debt to God's justice, not to Satan. It is the fact that God is just and the justifier. So God being just, um, because he alone is holy, required the payment of the debt. Sin is a debt against God. It in no way is a debt against Satan. 
And so that debt that we owe God in the older translations of the um, of the Lord's Prayer, um, where it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So um, that really paints the picture there of how we are indebted to God because of our sin. And just as we would forgive others who are indebted to us when they've done us wrong. And then from the Latin, there's the Christus Victor um, atonement theory. And uh, this is a key aspect of atonement theology in the East, as well as uh, some of the Reformed uh, teaching, um, or the Reformed teaching and, and uh, some in the Lutheran uh, camp. Um, it emphasizes Christ's victory over the powers of death and hell at the cross. And so we know that was ultimately where he conquered and as well as where he paid our ransom. Yet um, this can only be true because his death cancels the law's death sentence upon us. And you can, you can see that in 1 Corinthians 15 as the Apostle Paul uh, spells out this idea of death, where is your sting? Um, because we know the sting of death is uh, sin. And so uh, Christ from the Latin is victorious over the powers of uh, death and hell by his um, sacrifice on the cross. Then there's the satisfaction theory. And um, this is associated with um, the 11th century theologian Anselm. And it understands Christ's atonement primarily as an appeasement of God's offended dignity rather than his divine justice. And so it's not just that God was offended, or, or the correct view would be not just that God was offended, um, and therefore that appeases his offense, but rather that God is just, God is holy, God is righteous, and um, that his divine justice had to be uh, satisfied. And so it just falls a little bit short uh, there in regards to its view of God. Um, and then there's a couple others that have to do with, with a, a moral viewpoint and um, the moral influence uh, uh, theory interprets the atonement as a demonstration of God's love rather than as a satisfaction of God's dignity or his justice. And, and the effect of the atonement is just to provide a moving example of God's love that would so be evident that his love would so be overwhelming that it would induce sinners to repent. Um, and uh, we have to be careful there because even though Christ's coming um, is as a res is a result of uh, or partly a result of God's love, as John three sixteen tells us, God so loved, um, but God didn't do it as an example of His love. Um, God did it as the ultimate sacrifice and price that had to be paid for our wrong and uh, for Him to justify. Uh, those that uh, that he calls to himself and so um, we have to be very careful there um, as well as the moral government and uh, this view sees Christ's atonement as exhibiting God's just government of the world in other words as creator he is just and establishes repentance for human beings uh, based on what Christ uh, has done on the cross and um, Again, we have to be careful, um, especially with some of these atonement theories um, and what they lead to, because Horton says uh, in, in your text um, that uh, views less than an understanding of penal substitution require lesser views of sin. And I would add to that that a lesser view of sin is also a great reduction in the proper view of God's holiness. And um, I believe we'll never fully uh, comprehend the depth of our sin and what Christ accomplished on the cross. Um, but we also, on this side of eternity, will never um, ascertain a fullness of the holiness of God, of, of how holy he is. So um, when we see these views in from a Christian's, uh, from, a, from a 
Christian historical uh, perspective of atonement. We need to be so careful in understanding that um, the full holiness of God um, brings about uh, the wrath against uh, the fullness of our sin. And, and so we don't want to reduce our view of sin, but neither do we want to reduce, reduce our view of the holiness of God. For it's the holiness of God that requires um, his uh, justice and the justness that we can know as a result of what Christ did for us on the cross. And, and take it from me, that is an aspect of the gospel that you will daily, if not hour by hour, and at every moment's opportunity, want to dwell on just exactly what God accomplished for uh, us on the cross, how vital it is that he did what he did through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and so I trust that you, you'll make that a point of, of constant meditation uh, in your mind, um, just mulling over again and again uh, what God has done for us. Uh, by his death on the cross. And so as we look at these different views of Christ and where um, uh, where they fall short as well as these atonement theories, um, I trust that it will bring us back to that place where um, we fully can see and know and have a greater understanding of what God has done for us on the cross of Jesus Christ. I trust that... Uh, You'll continue on in your studies, that you'll be encouraged, and most of all, um, that you'll be excited as you grow in your understanding of what God has done for you in Christ. God bless you.